So um, today, while Madam was giving her talk, I realized it's been it's been twelve years. That's I came back in two thousand ten October. Twelve years, and the learning learning still goes on. Each time I see Madam's slides, I realize there's so much more I need to change and I improve in my talk. So Madam, as a disciple, we just try and reach one one step, but the mentor position is too high. Hopefully, we sometimes are going to be near about that. Yes. So the other aspect, we all know the endometriosis and the reproductive age group. So Madam has talked about infertility and I'm going to briefly touch on the adolescent endometriosis. So as Madam did say, there are a lot of guidelines which are coming and the three guidelines I have taken is from the up to date that has been done in April 2022, from the ASHRAE guidelines which is also quite latest 2022 and the ACOG committee opinion on dysmenorrhea and endometriosis in adolescents. So just briefly starting with the case, just to put it in the right scenario, because each one of us do see these patients in the OPD. She's a 16 year old girl, had a menarche at 10 years age. For last four years, she's been complaining of very painful periods. And each time she has these particular painful periods is associated with nausea. Now it's become so severe that she's not going to school. She has pain even in between the cycles. Has been to several GPs and the gynecologist. Ultrasound was done, it was normal. Everyone reassured her, everything is fine, just take NSCIDs. And now even the NSCIDs are not effective. So, the clinical diagnosis or the provisional diagnosis, each one of us reaching here would make that of us an adolescent endometriosis. So, let's look at why is there so much of a time lag. So, this study does show 4,334 women who were surgically confirmed with endometriosis that they first experienced symptoms as an adolescent. They have to wait three times as long as an adult for the diagnosis to be made. It took longer before a diagnosis was made. They are not taken very seriously and they are told always nothing is wrong. So this is how it gets delayed. And whenever we see the incidence, is it really common? Yes, in our practice, if we really see the girls who come to us with chronic pelvic pain, 25 to 40 percent of them have endometriosis and these ones who come with pain and have not responded to NACIDs or COCs they have found that 50 to 70 percent of them have got endometriosis. So when does this process actually start? If we had the adult women having the endometriosis, two thirds of them said that actually this pain started when they were less than 20 years of age. And they have also found some cases that even in the pre menarche they found that these particular deposits were there. So whenever we get an adult woman with an endometriosis, actually it starts way back in adolescence, which has been missed or not treated because generally it starts quite early in their life. Now question is, do we really need to make this diagnosis early? Yes, we need to do it because if we start treatment early, we'll retard the disease progression, we'll decrease the long-term effects and we'll improve the quality of life of the adolescent and the woman. So there are, we all know how to take the history. So I'm not going to be going on to that, but just what are the pointers in adolescent history that we need to take, which will help us to make the diagnosis? First of all, is there a genetic predisposition? Yes. So all these adolescents, we need to ask if their first degree relatives have been affected by endometriosis because they have found that it is seven times higher if there's someone else who has had an endometriosis, which will help us think, yes, maybe she does have an endometriosis. Even the ASHRAE says that when you take the particular di history, look for positive family history, obstructive genital malformations and take history of early menarche and short menstrual cycle and cyclical absenteeism from school and use of oral contraceptives not as a contraception but for the treatment of dysmenorrhea. If a girl is giving you that history then it should really raise that she may be having endometriosis. So now let us look at the symptoms. Are they different from the adult endometriosis? So adults generally have a cyclical pain, but it has been seen that in adolescents, it's predominantly acyclical pain. So if you look from the percentage which has seen that cyclical pain is only 9%, while acyclical pain is in 28% and both cyclical and acyclical are there in 63%. So normally the adolescents will have, apart from cyclic, they have an acyclic pain also associated and they have other genital urinary symptoms like gastrointestinal pain or they have a urinary complaint that may be present. Isolated cyclic pain is the least common symptom in adolescent. Deep endometriosis is less common and even ovarian endometriomas are very uncommon in the adolescents. Second, difference in physical examination. The ASHRAE recommends that we all know that vaginal examination is one of the best methods. But in these girls who may not be sexually active, 
we need to tell the patient as well as the parents and inform them the importance and take a consent before we do a vaginal examination. And in case they are not happy with that, then a rectal abdominal examination may be better tolerated. They have given a tip that you can use that Q-tips and just introduce through the hymen. This will help us in two things. First of all, it will know whether the hymen is patent or not. And secondly, is there any obstructive or anomaly which may be present when you put in a Q-tip, which may be one of the congenital malformations like transverse vaginal septum or a microperforate. So sometimes this particular Q-tip introduction also may help out because if you do that, even the pain can be felt in these particular girls. How are the findings different from that of an adult? They rarely have a uterosacral nodularity because it's not too long. So you will not get that particular feeling and rarely do we feel or see endometriomas in the adolescents. They're more commonly present in the case of adults. CA125, Madam has clearly stated that CA125 is no longer used as a screening test. It's only used lies in its follow-up. And if normally the follow-up, we always ask the patient how their symptomatic follow-up is done. But if you really need, then it's only meant for a follow-up. Does ultrasound have any value as far as adolescent is concerned? It says it has a very less value in endometriosis and adolescence because we rarely get endometriomas in the case of adolescent. They are very small nodules which are present. So the typical superficial peritoneal lesions are normally not picked up by means of an ultrasound. But yes, it is useful to rule out any other cause which may be there of a chronic pelvic pain. MRI should never be used as a first line of imaging because of its expense and poor sensitivity in picking up the peritoneal nodules. It can be helpful to better define abnormality found on the ultrasound. So ESHA combines everything and says the transvaginal ultrasound is recommended to be used in adolescents in whom it is appropriate as, as it is effective in diagnosing ovarian endometriosis. If transvaginal is not there, MRI, transabdominal, transperineal, transrectal scans can be used. But before transvaginal, you need to take a consent and explain them what exactly you are going to be doing about it. Coming to the management of endolescents, NACID and COCs of progesterone only therapy for the first three months. It's not exclusive that you only give them NACIDs. If you're thinking clinically of endometriosis, it's NACID and uh, COCs of progesterone only therapies, which means the Dynogest. And initially, the up to date says that you can give them a cyclic, when you are still clinching your diagnosis, a cyclical low dose combination therapy. Or you can use progesterone only therapy, which is Dynogest can be given continuously, should be given along with the NACIDs. What if they're not responsive? You have given them for three months and they're not responsive. What do you do next? So they say there's no data suggesting that you should change over to any other progestin or COCs. You really need to move on to the next step. Now, what is the next step that you go on for there? There the ACOG says that patient may need a laparoscopy for definite diagnosis. SJ2 further says in adolescents with suspected endometriosis where imaging is negative and the medical treatment has not been successful, diagnostic laparoscopy may be considered because when we do that, 50 to 70 percent of them are found to have endometriosis. Now, a few tips about the laparoscopy which is very well elaborated in all these guidelines. He says, as we have already said previously, any laparoscopy should not be diagnostic. It has to be diagnostic and therapeutic. To be done by a person who understands the adolescent abdomen and is an expert to do it. To minimize the scarring, it's better to go through the umbilicus in these young girls, otherwise they'll have a scar. The two lower ports, they say, make it more close to the pubic symphysis or to that particular line so that later the hair will grow so that they are not able to see those particular ports. Normally the lesions that are seen are the red flame lesions because they are the active lesions. We rarely get the burnt out lesions in these cases. Peritoneal windows or defects are more commonly seen in the adolescents. Sometimes there may be very small lesions like clear shiny peritoneal lesions which may not be seen. So they said just put in a little sal saline. These tend to become a little more effective and you can see them much better. If there is no evidence, take a posterior cul-de-sac biopsy because you need to rule out the histology. And this has further been established by the ASHRAE guidelines which says that clinicians should consider taking biopsies to confirm the diagnosis histologically. Radical excisional surgery, peritoneal stripping and all should not be done in them because that leads to greater additions in these young girls. Post-treatment, yes, you should follow them up by medical therapy because this will prevent the further progression and this medical therapy can be continued till the girl wants to get pregnant. 
So what is the medical therapy that you can do? It can be continuous combined hormonal contraception, it can be dinogest or it can be LNG IUS if the woman, if the girl is ready. If these are not effective, it is only then that the GnRH analogs can be given. And GnRH analogs always to be given with an add back therapy because this is the age group where the bone mass will be badly affected if you are giving the GnRH analogs. So it is recommended that the moment you start the GnRH analogs, start the add back therapy simultaneously. What is the best add back therapy for them? It's conjugated equine estrogen plus norethidron acetate. Some people only give non ethicetron acetate, but they say it is better for these particles that both of them are given for better quality of life and preserving the bone therapy. Follow up, do you need to do a DEXA scan for them? If you're giving them 12 months, you do not need to do a DEXA scan. If it's going to go beyond that, then yes, we need to do a DEXA scan. Always advise them from calcium, vitamin D, weight bearing exercises. And once the lupride has been stopped, then we can continue with the continuous hormone therapy can be given. And what about the fertility preservation? If you're going in an adolescent where you expect it to be totally plastered, it's good to have a dis discussion with the parent and the girl that in case, because we are going to lose out a lot of tissue, we may have to do that. Would they require a fertility preservation? This discussion can be taken prior to taking the patient up for any surgery. So that is uh, just to put this into three it's a flow chart and algorithm which is given in the up to date 2020 and I felt it's something that was very good. So it says that take a history with pain diary, physical examination and abdominal ultrasound. Give them a trial of cyclical hormone therapy and NSCIDs. Either she will improve or she will not improve. If she improves, it's just primary dysmenorrhea, you continue. If she does not improve, it's a secondary, maybe endometriosis is your greater chance. So you have two options, one them, give them continuous H, that that's a cyclical hormone therapy or you're giving a progesterone only pills but the other arrow which is a dotted is the one that they say you should generally follow that is you go ahead with the laparoscopy if they do not respond to your therapy in case there you're going for a continuous progesterone only pills if they improve well and good continue if they do not improve less than 18 years of age go for laparoscopy if greater than 18 years you can try the GnRH analogs with them each laparoscopy, please do a histo histology to see what exactly it is over there. And again, it goes on to say if she responds, she doesn't respond. Basic aim is that if she's less than 16, there is no GnRH analogs. It's only after 16 that you're going to give them. And otherwise, the pain treatment continues with that. So with that, uh, it's about the guidelines and uh, basic about it. So just uh, one or two cases. It's not essentially an endometriosis, but a little different cases from which Madam has taken. So she's an 18 year old girl with severe dysmenorrhea since last four years. Diagnosed case of bilateral endomet endometriosis already on dinogest 2 milligram for last two years. After initial response, now she has no relief. We did an ultrasound, bilateral endometriomas, four to five centimeters, kissing each other. She still has a lot of pain. Findings have been same as before. She's never had a surgery done before. So what would you like to take her up now for? Yeah, 18 years. This all discussion can be taken beforehand with her that what because post-op she will require. One thing is very clear after surgery she needs a post-op treatment. So in a post-op you can think of the GnRH agonist for this particular patient, Dinogest for this patient or LNG IUS at this patient if she's ready. Yes. And even talk about the because AMH was not done. I think AMH should have been done prior to this. And we can even consider. So this patient, of course, uh, went for a surgery, widespread adhesions, cystectomy and adiolysis was done and when the histopath was done, it, there were widespread tubercular granulomas for her at this part. So that is another this that whenever we have an endometriosis not responding to your medical treatments, we always have to keep tuberculosis in mind. So this is a last case, a little different one. She is a 4 years old post-menopausal. She was known case of endometriosis. Everyone waited menopause ho sab ho jaage, menopause ho gaya isko. She was asymptomatic till 2 years ago but now she started developing chronic pain abdomen. Ultrasound done, uterus post-menopausal, ET bot hai, 4 millimeters hai, but there is a right side endometrium of 4 into 5 centimeter. Since the last ultrasound it has increased. Previously it was 2 into 3 centimeters, now it's become 4 to 5. So is it medical or surgical? Yes, we are in consensus. What is the aim of the surgical treatment? What is the aim of our surgical treatment? 
Yes. So our main aim for this particular one is first of all we cannot give them any or estrogens to these patients anyway. Neither GNR or analog is going to work because by seeing their FSH level is so low, so what will they do? So that is the main thing is to rule out a malignancy. Just in case she is not feasible for a surgery, then what do you do? What medical treatment do we have if she is not feasible for surgery? So I would like to end with this particular line yeah. that the road that we travel is long. The road of endometriosis is very very long. But if we have hope in our hearts, we go. We go. On.